All right. And Dale Eisler joins me now from Regina. Dale, how are you doing today? Good, Sean. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on to talk about From Left to Right, Saskatchewan's Political and Economic Transformation. As I said in the intro, I had the opportunity to live in Regina for a couple of years. It's where I did my master's degree. I was actually there for the 2007 provincial election. Uh, no. I did not vote. I did not vote in that election. I was not eligible to. I hadn't been there uh, long enough yet. But, you know, I, I had the chance to see a little bit of this political transformation. But before we get into some of the specifics of it, just just what is your experience? I know you, I talked about it in the intro, you have a, a long political background, but how do you manage the whatever partisan interest you have to studying it? This is something I've always been fascinated by, by people who, by their poli sci people, journalists, you know, everyone's going to have an opinion, a political opinion. So how do you manage that relationship between your own political work your political affiliations and studying the evolution of political ideology, uh, both in Saskatchewan and nationally. Yeah, it's a good question, and you know everybody has their natural sort of proclivities and biases when it comes to uh, you know politics and government and whatnot. I, I I've never been like uh, partisanly aligned in any in any particular way uh, throughout my life. That doesn't mean I don't have uh, certain, you know, ideas about uh, uh, you know, ideology and whatnot. So, and being a journalist, I was a journalist for like 25 years, and then I went into government, uh, the federal government, and now back to here uh, to Saskatchewan. Um, y- you know, as a journalist, you got to be fairly um, independent in terms of your thought and and not impose your particular uh, uh, beliefs necessarily on uh, when you're exploring issues. And I used to write a column here in Saskatchewan for many years on politics. And I tried to use the column as um, kind of a forum for ideas in a sense. So there were times I would take on an issue from a particular perspective or, or, or an argument uh, that I might not entirely agree with, but I thought it was useful in terms of sort of the public dialogue to do that, to get kind of issues out and uh, explored and expressed uh, in, in different ways so that it wasn't just my voice that was uh, necessarily speaking here, but rather some ideas. Hmm. So I tried to do and the that's same thing that in terms of I, the book. Sorry. Yeah. And that's something that, no, so uh, my, my fault there, uh, sorry to cut you off, but I do think that's something that comes across in the book. And I, I, I get the sense that within Canadian journalism writ large, we're pretty good at that by by having ideas present themselves. It's not as much, it strikes me, gotcha stuff or or personality contest. It certainly is a little bit, uh, but of course. But I think we're pretty good at, at putting forth the ideas. And from your experience, is my assessment of that accurate? Do you think that ideas do kind of carry the day when we're doing any sort of political assessment in this country? Well, I think in in general terms, as you say, yes. Uh, I don't think that that we've deteriorated into the kind of the really hard polarized partisan atmosphere that you see in the United States, which now gets expressed through uh, the various uh, media outlets and channels. Uh, you know, we it, we have some of that in Canada, but not to the same degree. So I think that um, generally speaking, journalism in Canada does a pretty good job. I mean, you can always make uh, your arguments about, uh, um, you know, partisan bias, maybe coming into some opinion pieces and whatnot. But when I think when it comes to the news, I think it's it's all pretty solid journalism in Canada to the credit of, uh, of journalists. Uh, and we're in a world where there's less and less of that, of that. So I think it's something that we can take a little bit of comfort in in Canada that I think our journalism is still pretty strong. So let's get into the specifics of the book and, and the, suspe- the specifics of politics in Saskatchewan, again, from left to right. And Saskatchewan did elect Tommy Douglas, the home of, uh, in many polls, the, the greatest Canadian. And uh, the idea of health care, um, uh, universal health care emerged out of Saskatchewan. So if, if we were to go back 70 years and into that era, what was the political ideology of Saskatchewan that led to that voting block that those individuals voting a CCF government into power and what was the appeal of it at that time 
Well, I think if you go back 70 years or even more and you look at, at Saskatchewan and kind of the development of the, of the political economy of Saskatchewan, this is a time uh, when agriculture was very dominant in Saskatchewan in terms of, in, in both an economic and a social sense. You know, the fabric of rural Saskatchewan is very much about smaller farms, small towns, lots of them and whatnot. And out of that grew this agrarian kind of populism um, back in the, well, you can go back to the 1920s or even before, but then in the in the 30s with the Depression, where uh, farmers in Saskatchewan, I mean, pragmatically, they needed to uh, create more market power for themselves because they were small individual farmers. And, and you know, they were kind of the captive of, of big grain companies and the railways and whatnot. So they just naturally, uh, uh, you know, went towards um, kind of the cooperative movement, working together, farm organizations, uh, the Saskatchewan wheat pool. So that was very much the culture uh, uh, of the time. And this was what really was the underpinning of the of the CCF at that time, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which was the precursor to the uh, New Democratic Party. And that's what brought uh, Douglas to power. He was a prairie populist who, uh, you know, w- was very much uh, adhered to sort of the social gospel, as it was called, where you apply some Christian principles to politics and um, the role of, of, of government in, in society. So that was the sort of the, the foundation in many respects of Saskatchewan. But over the decades, that economy uh, uh, changed dramatically. And that's kind of what I try to get into in, in terms of this book, how the, the province changed and with it, its political attitudes. And I wonder how much of this is generational, because when you have Douglas and this rise to power, as you talk about, that's a generation the, the majority of that voting block at that time has lived through the Depression. And certainly the Depression hit Saskatchewan very hard. They also lived through the Second World War. And for as much as issues associated with conscription are so centered around the linguistic divide, certainly rural populations were very opposed to conscription as well. So you you have this coalescing of a generation around these major traumatic events that would, in my head, lead towards a, a more cooperative society. And these ideas of bringing everybody together are very appealing. So as we go through the, the second half of the 20th century, is there something that is generational that as that generation frankly, starts to die uh, and, and the baby boom starts, the baby boomers start to become the preeminent voting block within Saskatchewan, since they didn't have that same lived experience as their parents' generation, does that help explain part of this political transformation that you track in the book? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, very true, that sort of the baby boom generation, which you know uh, came after the, the Second World War, didn't have the experience of the depression, which my parents lived through the depression. I'm a baby boomer. And my parents were very shaped by the trauma, the economic and social trauma of the 1930s and its impact on people in their lives. And they had this kind of personal sort of belief that the hard times could come back. So you needed to be always prepared for that and to live within your means and these sorts of things. So it was almost a a kind of a conservative ethic in in many ways, but also a, a real strong sense of community. And so the subsequent generations didn't go through that, those hardships, as you mentioned. And I think not having that lived experience, uh, and as the further we get away from, from that generation of, uh, of the, dep- the depression generation, the weaker sort of those uh, values become. And I think that's been a part of it. I mean, there, there are many elements in this story, and I think uh, generational change is, uh, is definitely a part of it. So you mentioned the idea of prairie populism earlier and the, the rise of prairie populism surrounding Tommy Douglas. How does populism differ for rural Saskatchewan communities compared to some of the populist movements that we've seen in the past? Take urban workers in the early 20th century around unionization, right? That Those are populist movements. So how does the Saskatchewan case differ or perhaps relate to those other more urban populism uh, political movements that we saw earlier in the 20th century? Yeah, well, I think the the, the populism of, in Saskatchewan's case was very much rural based, as you said, and it, and it flowed from 
the the sort of the economic uh, challenges that 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 people face and the need to work collectively. So uh, when you had somebody like Douglas who could who could uh, you know tap into those beliefs and, and express it in, in really strong uh, strong ways that that motivated people, uh, it became you know a, a powerful force in Saskatchewan for a, a number of decades. And if you look at in terms of sort of urban population populism versus uh, rural or agrarian populism, I mean that's what the whole NDP was. It was an attempt to take the the rural populism of the CCF, which was very sort of agrarian based and whatnot, and marry it with the the the, the labor movement in in central Canada, largely right, to, to to form the new Democratic Party. And I mean that was the 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 foundation for it in uh, when the party was formed in 1961. So. But that's always been an uncomfortable marriage, so to speak, in Saskatchewan for the NDP, because, you know, farm interests are not always aligned with labor interests in the cities. And you get into issues of, you know, work stoppages that involve railways or grain companies or uh, th that really directly affect the livelihoods and the well-being of farmers. You know, that's difficult. And there was always a tension in the Saskatchewan NDP between these two uh, dimensions uh, when it came to, you know, the, the, the fusion of, of agrarian populism with uh, the labor movements of, of um, central Canada, for that matter. And what was the opposition to the CCF during this time? Because obviously we get to the Saskatchewan party and the, the situation in Saskatchewan now where it really is uh, very much seen as a, as a conservative bastion both provincially and federally, but where's the origin of that opposition and, and how does it start to increase its influence? Or as the popular messaging goes, every time there is an election, uh, whether it's the provincial election or the federal election, someone will mention the NDP closing rural hospitals and that being a really significant turning point politically in Saskatchewan. So do we see the, the a, a rise of conservative values, people attaching themselves to the ideology of the right of center organizations, or is there really the, the backlash to the NDP or is there some mix of, of the two that's going yeah. on that really culminates? Yeah, I, I, Sean, I think it's really a, a mixture of, of many factors, including the two that, that you mentioned. Certainly, uh, Tough decisions that the NDP government had to take in the early uh, 1990s in Saskatchewan were pivotal because they faced a real fiscal crisis, as I talk about in the book. And, uh, you know, the agenda was kind of dictated to them when they took power. They really had to do this to, to address uh, uh, their budgetary crisis. And uh, one of the areas that they focused on, and I think it was the right policy and fiscal decision at the time, was rural hospitals. I mean, Saskatchewan had far more hospital beds per capita than any other province uh, in the country. And that sort of network of, of rural hospitals had been developed over many decades when there was uh, uh, rural Saskatchewan was far more populous and there were, you know, uh, many more towns and whatnot. And, and many of them had, 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 uh, had ceased to exist for that matter. So that was, that really damaged them politically in rural Saskatchewan. There's no doubt about that. But there was always... Uh, uh, a certain element in, in, in rural Saskatchewan that was uncomfortable with certain things that the CCF and more latterly the NDP espoused, uh, one of them being the land bank, which uh, the Blakeney government, government in the 1970s established, which was to address the, the intergenerational transfer of land from, from you know, people who wanted to leave the land, wanted to be able to sell it, and their children and, or whomever who wanted to, you know, purchase it and move on to, the, and so this was going to be a kind of a transition vehicle where people could sell to the government to the land bank, and then uh, other people could rent that land and then purchase it eventually. Well, what happened was the land, uh, not much of it got sold after it went into government's hands, and this was very much uh, against the ethic of rural Saskatchewan, which was, you know, uh, the whole sort of impetus to settle the prairies was the fact that people could get their own plot of land, right? We had all the incentives for, in terms of settlement, for people to get essentially free land and they owned it. And so these were private landowners who are, who are farmers. So, you know, there, there was always this uh, unease with uh, government uh, exercising that kind of uh, influence in terms of ownership of land in the province. So all these factors together, uh, weakened the NDP's uh, position in rural Saskatchewan. And there was always a, 
a strong element uh, of, of sort of conservative thought amongst rural Saskatchewan people as well, because it's interesting to, to note that uh, rural Saskatchewan was very supportive of John Diefenbaker, the progressive conservative leader and prime minister back in the 50s and early 60s, right? So you had this mm-hmm. transferable vote that federally would vote progressive conservative in those days would vote CCF NDP, right? And the roots of that was really kind of the populism because Diefenbaker was seen as kind of a populist. He was an outsider in terms of Ottawa. He was a Westerner, right? And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, very much positioned himself as a, as a populist leader, which appealed to people here. So, you know, he got that support and then provincially, that, that support would move to the CCF NDP under Douglas. Is there any part of this that is uh, obviously the, the populism, but is there any divide between fiscal versus social conservatism within that, that you mentioned the earlier, the, the idea that people in Saskatchewan, you, you work hard and there's a certain, certain conservative values to the CCF that, uh, that is, as it's coming to power, during the post second world war years but how much of there is a discussion between the economics versus the social versus the the cultural values that determine where people tend to go politically yeah well i think that in cultural terms rural saskatchewan has always been quite conservative people uh, are are you know they're not known to be overly like like in in most parts of rural canada i think they're they're this the same here so they're on on, on cultural issues social issues or cultural i i would say uh, they tend to be uh, conservative and as the ndp uh evolved and migrated to more liberal cultural sort of values and whatnot that also i think uh for many people uh made them uncomfortable in rural saskatchewan they uh, uh, they saw it as not reflective of kind of their kind of uh, social and cultural values in 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 rural Saskatchewan. Now another issue that we've talked about on the show before that I'm curious again as we talk about this the shift from left to right is the changing nature of of rural work and the corporatization of agriculture and the idea of small single family farms start to, you start to see conglomeration. You start to see large companies start to buy more and more land and have farmers essentially as employees or like land lease situations. How much does this, that changing reality of the economics of agricultural work in the province, how does that influence the political transformation that you're tracking in the book. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that's a very crucial sort of element to all this and how rural Saskatchewan uh, changed over the course of the last about 40 years from what was a a sort of a rural pattern of family farms, smaller, but, you know, uh, uh, not real large uh, uh, farms for that matter. And, you know, small communities that uh, served the, uh, agricultural interests of that area. And as market markets changed, we lost orderly marketing in Canada in terms of uh, uh, the Canadian wheat board, uh, the, um, the loss of the crow rate, uh, you know, which, which helped uh, or subsidized uh, freight rates for farmers so that the, you know, railways were not allowed to charge the, the, the compensatory rate that, it, that, uh, they needed to move this grain so so farmers were protected in that way and smaller farmers could exist well when the crow rate died and when global mar- and orderly marketing dissolved in in effect uh you now had uh sort of the economic forces of globalization and whatnot impacting on farms and farmers now could sell their 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 uh, products directly wheat grain whatever it might be canola lentils right and instead of going through a big marketing uh, agency like the Canadian Wheat Board, they could make their own marketing decisions. And so in that world, you got uh, a growth in, to, to, to remain economic, larger farms we got the, uh, with, with technology and everything else. I mean, farmers are far more productive now than they used to be because of the, the type of machinery that can be used. So we've had this progression of uh, smaller farms disappearing, larger corporate farms emerging and that 
you know, change the psychology of rural Saskatchewan in many respects, where this this need for collectivization, for people to work together uh, in uh, through cooperatives or marketing boards, whatever it might be, was no longer dominant. And that changed, therefore, pe- people's political attitudes as well. Does supply management influence that uh, as well? Does, does the increased role of supply management within the economics of agriculture, does that have a similar influence on the way people approach not only their work, but also potentially their political outlook? Uh, I, I would think so, yes. But uh, supply management is not very dominant in Saskatchewan, right? I mean, you find that in, in uh, uh, dairy production and, and uh, uh, egg marketing and whatnot. We don't have a lot of that in Saskatchewan. Here it's more, you know, just it's crop agriculture. And uh, uh, there is no supply management around that. I mean, things like supply management, like the Canadian Wheat Board, which which managed the sale of Canadian wheat internationally, you know, had some control in the sense of, you know, they had an initial price for wheat, then a final price, depending on what the market uh, uh, dictated. Uh, all that's gone now. And it's all individual operators out there on the farm. I mean, they're, they're, they're not part of any sort of broader organization like they used to be. The National Farmers Union, which used to be fairly strong in Saskatchewan, virtually doesn't exist anymore. Uh, And any uh, grain organization, the Western Canada Wheat Growers, are very much free market uh, uh, organizations. So that's just changed the psychology of people on the farm. And going, going back to your earlier point about generational change, this is also a generation that didn't experience the difficulties uh, confront the difficulties of the of the depression in those years, and you know the lessons that might have been learned from that. They've they've never experienced that, so you know they they, uh, they take a different perspective. For sure. Uh, now, another major economic shift or, or growth within the province has been um, mining and uh, further extraction of of energy resources within the province. So, how much does uh, the political positioning towards resources and mining influence the overall political shape of the province? Because certainly contemporarily, left versus right, there are very different approaches to the management of energy. Yeah, for sure. Well, actually, I think the the best way to describe that, and I get into this in the book, is the whole privatization agenda of the 1980s that the former Grant Divine government uh, uh, embarked upon. And uh, during the 70s, you saw the, the NDP government of Alan Blakeney um, move very much towards public ownership of natural resources in Saskatchewan as it related to potash, uranium, oil. There, you had uh, crown corporations that, that were directly engaged in the market in an ownership basis. And in fact, potash became very symbolic in Saskatchewan in the 1970s when an aggressive sort of nationalization by the Blakeney government in, uh, in 1976 and, and the subsequent few years, where the uh, government took control of more than 50% of the potash production in the province. And you got to understand that Saskatchewan is the biggest potash producer in the world. So now you had a government enterprise, the Potash Corporation, Saskatchewan, playing a very big role. So then 10 years later, the divine government, the conservatives come in, and what they do is privatize the Potash Corporation and uranium and, and oil as well. And to my mind, and I make this argument in the book, this was really a a pretty pivotal moment in terms of the transformation because the NDP essentially lost its identity when that happened because the role of the Blakeney government in the 1970s was very uh, central in terms of the NDP's sense of itself. And that was built around the nationalization of of, uh, natural resources. When that was changed in the late 80s by Divine through privatization, the, I, I, I believe ever since the NDP has been struggling to find sort of its its new identity because uh, nationalization of, of resources is no longer on the public agenda here. It, you know, the NDP doesn't uh, propose it. It's just not happening. Uh, so I think they've had difficulty in adjusting to that reality. And, you know, they, they cling to the, the Medicare story of, of 1962, but that's a long time ago now, right? And they needed... You might want, you, you could say, you know, the NDP has failed to modernize itself in terms of realizing the changes that have happened in the world and in the economy. And how do they adapt to that in policy terms? 
And it's also very evident in rural Saskatchewan, where I think the NDP has uh, been unable to um, outline an agric- a coherent agricultural policy in this world where there's, it, it's really free market out there right now. And that's what people in rural Saskatchewan adhere to and believe in. So how does the NDP respond to that? It's a big challenge. Now, of course, we talked a lot here about what the NDP has done wrong, potentially, or how they might not be connecting with folks. But what has the Saskatchewan party done so well that they have become the dominant party politically uh, within the province? Uh, There doesn't seem to be any short term hiccups to that. It seems like they're they're pretty well ensconced there in Regina. So what have they done effectively to pick up where the NDP has lost? Yeah, well, I think they were fortunate in terms of timing for to begin with. I mean, the Saskatchewan Party was formed in the latter part of the 1990s. It was a, an amalgamation of the former Progressive Conservative Party, which had been badly tainted by the divine government for various uh, various reasons. And and the uh, and the liberals. There was a, a provincial liberal party, not that strong, but it was it it, it was a, a viable party. And so they came together and, and created the Saskatchewan Party. And it took, you know, uh, the better part of ten years before they won power. But it it it, it became uh, you know a case of, you know, the NDP had been in power from 1991 to 2007. So you know they time for a change sort of mentality. I think took hold, but also. The, the Sask party took over at a time when the Saskatchewan economy was really beginning to grow and take off because of the, the resource prices uh, were very high. We're in kind of a resource super cycle that actually started in, in the final couple of years of the previous NDP government. But uh, and Brad Wall, who was the leader, was also a very, very skilled politician, a great communicator and, he, and, and a, a populist himself. He was really the you know, uh, since the days of Douglas, uh, we really, well, the, Grant Devine for a time was seen as, and he was, a, 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 it took a populist approach to politics. Uh, but the NDP was never able to sort of find that kind of leadership after Douglas left. At any rate, Wall arrives on the scene, great communicator, very skilled. The economy is really starting to take off and they benefited from that. He uh, was, uh, you know, and he ran a, a very pragmatic government is the other thing. Um, the Saskatchewan party is certainly right leaning even more so today than, than under, under wall wall was very, very pragmatic. And an example of that, and this goes, this is again, part of the potash story here. Uh, potash is such a iconic kind of thing in Saskatchewan in terms of the psychology of the province, the importance of potash, uh, back in around uh, 2010, 11 BHP billetin from Australia, big, uh, global mining company. Uh, tried uh, uh, with a hostile takeover of the Potash Corporation. Now, the Potash Corporation had been privatized by Divine back in the 1980s, but many Saskatchewan people still thought it was, a, you know, a crown corporation. They just, you know, didn't really know. Uh, but the point was, everybody in the province knows that Potash is really important to the economy of the province. And Wall, uh, being, you know, a conservative and a believer in the free market, obviously, uh, intervened on this in a fairly significant way and played a key role in that deal not going through. Ultimately, the federal government made the decision not to go ahead with it, right? But it was in large measure because of the pressure that Wall brought to bear, and he was seen as defending the interest of Saskatchewan by doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a very powerful signal that he sent that kind of strengthened his own political position. Yeah, I, I had the opportunity to see Brad Wall give a speech uh, when I was out there. And yeah, he he's a, a polished guy. He, he, he's one of these politicians where he enters the room and he's kind of the center of the room. He sort of attracts uh, people to yeah. him and a very affable guy when, when when you see him around. How does Scott Moe fit into that? Like, is, is he obviously he benefited from Brad Wall, uh, but certainly he's not Brad Wall. And, and there's been criticism of him from various corners of the province. But do you see him really being able to maintain this political dominance that we've seen over the past 15 years? Yeah, yeah. certainly a good question. And uh he and he is not a populist, uh, Scott Moe, not at all. Like Wall, I mean, he's he's uh, solid, uh, you know, a rural background and whatnot. Uh, but um, he certainly doesn't have the charisma of Wall. Uh, 
And uh, to this point, I think that Scott Moe has benefited from the fact the NDP is so weakened that there is, there, you know, there is no real strong opposition uh, and they're not seen as, as an alternative. And, and Mo, I mean, you can criticize, and many people do, his handling of the pandemic in Saskatchewan. And I think credibly so, you can, you can criticize some of the decisions taken, uh, particularly in the last six or eight months. Uh, but uh, Saskatchewan is still doing quite well economically. Um, and again, uh, the government has grown a lot under the Saskatchewan party. I was looking at this the other day. The, in the last year of the NDP government, Lauren Calvert was the premier back in 19, or 2007, uh, government expenditures uh, amounted to $9,000 per capita in Saskatchewan. That's how much government expenditures, uh, uh, if you do the calculation. Uh, last year, it was just over $17,000 per capita. So that tells you, since the Saskatchewan party has taken office, uh, expenditures by government have grown by almost 100%. Uh, so, yeah, they, they, they're a conservative government and they, and, they, and they speak the language of conservatives and they do a good job of, of uh, you know, attacking Ottawa. But they've also been a government that uh, has, you know, been pretty active in terms of its spending. Yeah, that's a remarkable increase uh, in spending in, in just that amount of time. And in certainly circumstances surrounding everything that's been going on, I, I'm sure they would argue, had influenced that. Uh, now, one of the yeah. things that comes up uh, in the book that I'm really interested to, to get your thoughts on is, is how does Saskatchewan potentially foreshadow other trends across the country? If you go back to Tommy Douglas, the idea of universal health care, some of the other policies that that government brought forth provincially, we then see federally and we see uh, a, an increased voting share of the socialist parties in federal elections. Is there a canary in the coal mine type situation here for populism, for conservatism uh, at the federal level? Or is Saskatchewan really its its own unique case study? While at the same time, you know, we always hear that elections are won and lost in Toronto, Montreal, and those suburbs. So how much power in a federal election does the province actually have voting wise? Yeah, well, it certainly doesn't have much power voting wise in terms of federal elections. Uh, we have, I think, 12 constituencies in the entire province. So we're not a, a significant uh, factor that way. I I don't necessarily see Saskatchewan as some kind of leading indicator here for Canada in terms of where we might be going, right? Uh, but uh, what I sort of take away from it is that we maybe put too much emphasis on seeing politics in an ideological sort of through an ideological lens that is just left right sort of thing i think that people most people and i'm not uh, obviously there are people on uh, on the extremes both left and right and they can be quite vociferous and quite loud but i think the vast majority of people certainly in saskatchewan are pretty centrist pretty pragmatic and they will respond to kind of reality as as they see it and really that's what's happened in saskatchewan you know the, the nature of the the agricultural economy changed dramatically. And with that, you know, people change their habits and they change, they, they recognize where their interests lie. I mean, it, everything is driven by self-interest and farmers back in the days of uh, the CCF NDP, when they were forming cooperatives and whatnot, they were acting in self-interest. This was the best means for them to protect their livelihoods and their incomes and whatnot. Uh, people are acting the same way today. It's just that the conditions ha have changed. But, you know, <clears throat> We're seeing so much of this around the world in terms of the rise of populism and 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 um, um, just greater controversy, uh, polarized type controversy as it appears. So I, I think that Saskatchewan simply reflects that. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, wouldn't want to say that it's somehow, as you say, a canary in the coal mine. I think right. what's happening here is has happened here is happening elsewhere. And it's almost more of a rural-urban divide in many respects around the world. Yeah, and I think that's what's really interesting about Saskatchewan politically, too, is that when you look at the map, certainly in the federal election in the fall, sort of where vote share goes and, and the difference between what you see in Regina and Saskatoon percentage-wise compared to the, the rural ridings, 
Uh, but at the same time, I mean, Ralph Goodale lost his seat. So, uh, you know, that that was somebody who from afar and having lived in Regina, I was like, well, Ralph Goodale, he'll, he'll be there as long as he wants to. Uh, but he obviously was not. And you see those shifts. So, you know, but but is there something that we could learn then from that urban rural divide? And has Saskatchewan, whether culturally, politically, have they kind of managed to maintain a a positive relationship between the two? Because so often... It feels like the discussion is urban versus rural, as opposed to the two working in cooperation. Yeah, I think in Saskatchewan there isn't really a sense of uh, conflict or tension between rural and urban in that in a, in a broad broad sense. Clearly, politically there are some some divisions there, uh, and that's because uh, it's very ingrained in Saskatchewan the importance of agriculture to the province, to its identity, and to its economy. Uh, still to this day. And uh, so people recognize that and that our interests are are intertwined in that sense. Um, but, you know, the NDP has been uh, really relegated to a handful of urban seats, right? They, they, they really have nothing in rural Saskatchewan anymore. And, and that's the big challenge. How do they possibly sort of regain a foothold out there? Uh, it's not impossible, but, but uh, you know, it's not apparent how that's going to happen in the, in the near future, at least. And again, I go back to, you know, their, I mean, their farm policy for, for decades and generations was very much about the family farm and orderly marketing and defense of the crow rate and things like this. Well, that's all gone, right? And they haven't really replaced it with anything in terms of a vision. So um, I would say that uh, the rural-urban divide exists somewhat in Saskatchewan, but not to the extent that I think you would see in large in provinces that are more populous and have bigger urban centers. So would you say that you are optimistic about just the state of Saskatchewan politics? You know, we talked at the start about the divisive nature of, of partisan politics elsewhere that we see, you know, from afar. When I was there, certainly I got the sense that it was you present your ideas here's what's going to happen and that's what i saw in the, that 2007 election when i was there there wasn't the mudslinging but is, is there still that idea like like is there a place for or is saskatchewan still a place for ideas voting respectful discourse uh, and and can we at least if not if if even the political trends might not necessarily expand to the rest of the country is that something we could take out of saskatchewan that could be an export for the rest of us well, um, I don't know if I would call the political discourse respective here in, in the province necessarily. I mean, one of the, uh, the realities these days is that the government, the Saskatchewan party government, takes an incredibly hard line against the federal government and often personal against the prime minister. Uh, you know, so those relations are, are not good at all. You might even say kind of poisoned. And, you know, uh, that can then drive sort of you know, public attitudes as well. And, and the reality in Saskatchewan is, is uh, Justin Trudeau is not well liked by a large, I would say, I think a significant majority of people in this province. And they feel very strongly about that. And that's why you see this, the Scott Moe government take the stance that they do, which is very negative when it comes towards the federal government. So that's, that's divisive in its nature, but it's also reflective to a certain degree of Saskatchewan history. It's maybe more dramatic than it has been in the past, or at least throughout much of the past, uh, in terms of the harshness of it. But Saskatchewan has long sort of seen itself, or felt it's been alienated from federal power. I mean, that's the, that's the origins of politics in Saskatchewan, Western alienation. And that still exists today, and it's become arguably uh, more uh, acute than it has been uh, for a number of years. Yeah, and certainly a, a trend that you see uh, both in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba as well, within this particular yeah. constitution of the federal government, uh, a, a significant issue that plays out at the certainly the federal level, but the provincial level, and I'm sure at the municipal level in certain respects, when when you know, municipalities are looking for federal money that there's to, for certain projects, there's going to be tension there that certainly plays into right. it. So a lot of yeah. layers to these discussions. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
So uh, if you're interested in all this, which I hope you are, because we've really just gotten into it, there's a lot more uh, meat on the proverbial bone here. I encourage you to check out From Left to Right, Saskatchewan's Political and Economic Transformation. Uh, Dale, if people want to pick up a copy of the book or just learn more about you, uh, your career and your other books, this isn't your, your first, you have some other work out there. If people want to find out more about those, uh, where can they go to check that out? Uh, well, uh, I mean, th this book is the University of Regina Press is publishing it. And uh, so they have, there's one other book I did on Saskatchewan that they, they published a few years back called False Expectations. Um, so there's that one. I, I did uh, uh, also more recently um, a book, a novel actually, called Anton, A Young Boy, His Friend in the Russian Revolution. And that's, if you go to Amazon, you'll find it on there. And, and uh, it's uh, historical uh, fiction, as I mentioned, and uh, set in Ukraine, actually, in a small village in 1919. And uh, it actually became the basis for a movie, that a feature movie that was released uh, uh, in 2019. Uh, so that's one of the other things that I've, uh, I've, I've written. And I wrote a book back in the 80s yeah. on Ross Thatcher, the liberal premier from the 1960s. All right. So, a lot, yeah, a lot of stuff out there. Very cool. Uh, yeah, certainly the Anton book, certainly uh, timely.